Hello, everybody. How's it going? My name is Dominic Vermillion, and you're listening to the inaugural episode of my gaming podcast, in which we're kind of we're going to kind of recap the interesting news of the week as far as the gaming and technology world is concerned. We got a lot of fun stuff to talk about that I think is interesting, so we're going to kind of just dive right head first into it and not worry about why I'm doing this or how we're going to do it. We're going to just go. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is Call of Duty Black Ops 4. They recently released a trailer for the new Zombies mode of the game, and I'm not going to focus too much on Zombies itself. Most of you who are familiar with me know that I am deeply interested in becoming a competitive esports player on the search and destroy end of things. But what I want to talk about in regards to Zombies is the new trailer. Why do I want to talk about the new trailer? Well, I've always been a big fan of marketing and how music pairs with games, and I have a lot of memorable experiences with commercials and trailers that, that made a lasting impression on me. And when I found out that Avenged Sevenfold, one of my favorite bands of all time, as a metal enthusiast, was going to be creating an original song for it, I was really excited at first. But unfortunately, I watched the trailer, and I'm interested to know what you guys think. Uh, and I w was uh, kind of underwhelmed. Avenged Sevenfold had contributed to Black Ops 3, with an instrumental song called Jade Helm, which plays, you know, during the countdown of the multiplayer stuff. And it's funny, I didn't know that all the times I heard it, but I was like, man, whoever's on that guitar sounds a lot like Sinister Gates. And it was really, really cool. But I really, really enjoyed Avenged Sevenfold's single, Carry On, which was a single they made for Call of Duty Black Ops 2 that played at the end of the game. Uh, I thought it was really empowering and uplifting in terms of the lyrics, and then the guitar had some great, you know, virtuoso parts where the beginning of the song starts with this awesome epic solo and then a dive bomb on the tremolo bar. So I was super excited to, to check out this new Zombies trailer, and I don't know, I thought I thought the song kind of fell flat. The song's called Mad Hatter. I would certainly encourage you guys to take a look and uh, take a listen to it and let me know what you think. Zombies is going to be huge for Black Ops 4, just in general, because I think the absence of a regular single-player campaign gives them them a little bit more, um, I don't know, it puts the pressure on them to deliver more content up front. So Zombies fans are probably going to be really, really pleased with that. But as a big, big fan of the band, I thought this one kind of fell flat uh, just in terms of comparing it to their previous contribution to Call of Duty. And even if we go further back to the original Black Ops trailer, Eminem had a song, I think it was on his recovery album. He did it with Pink uh, and it was called Won't Back Down. And I encourage you guys to check out the trailer for the original Call of Duty Black Ops where that song is featured. I thought it paired really, really well, and it was kind of like Avenged Sevenfold's Carry On, where it was like high octane, high action, and it went well. And I know some people might disagree with my take on the new song Mad Hatter and how it pairs with the Zombies trailer, because I, I guess if it's, you know, characters walking through an undead wasteland, it's going to be a slower pace, a slower tempo. But nonetheless, uh, I'm interested to know what you guys think. I was super excited at first, but I thought that the single kind of fell flat a little bit. Um, and I'm trying not to have nostalgia goggles on, but I just kind of feel like a more active song does better than a more passive song. Um, a couple other examples I could think of are just uh, Bungie's Halo 2 back in the day uh, featured the song Blow Me Away by Canadian band Breaking Benjamin. And I thought it, it was an extremely appropriate fit. And uh, it did really well. So uh, anyway, I encourage you guys to check out the trailer. Let me know what you think about that. But we still got a lot more fun stuff to talk about. And, uh, as it pertains to Call of Duty Black Ops 4, we're kind of just getting started. But this was a trailer that just released this week. And I had, I had seen the original Zombies trailer where they're kind of on this Titanic boat. Um, and now they're kind of in something that looks like Ridley Scott's Gladiator. Uh, if it was overrun with the Undead, you got you got tigers with with red eyes and really cool bosses and ornate looking armor, and and some kind of antagonist who reminds me a lot of Sadler from another horror inspired game, um, Resident Evil 4. So it's going to be interesting to see how the zombies game shapes up. The game itself is uh, scheduled for release on October 12, 2018. So all we can kind of do is speculate and uh, just talk about what the three separate beta weekends were like. But none of those betas, I think, a lot of players to participate in the zombies. So we're still going to have to wait for the game to release to, to get a sense of what that experience is like. But we got some more Black Ops stuff to cover, so stick with me. Now that we're kind of into this uh, and I'm a little bit more relaxed, I, I, I want to say I am excited. I am really, really, really excited for Call of Duty Black Ops 4 on the multiplayer end of things. Uh, I was fortunate enough to participate in the first weekend's beta where I don't think Search and Destroy was made available until maybe uh, the, the third and final day of the first weekend. I didn't get 
much of a chance to participate in the second weekend, and then I, I spent a lot of time with the Blackout beta for the first two days of that. That was the longest one. I guess it was the most innovative and lofty thing they're trying, so that one gave you a full, like, five days, which was really exciting. But let's back up for a second here. I think Black Ops 4 is going to fundamentally change the way Call of Duty and competitive esports is played. Why do I say that? I think it has a lot in common with Counter-Strike and Overwatch. Um, and, and there's a lot I want to say, and I don't want to forget things, and I also don't want to make the mistake of trying to spit out everything at once. So I'm going to go through this one by one um, and, and point out things I've observed. The first thing I noticed uh, was the minimap in Call of Duty Black Ops 4, I think, operates a lot like the minimap in Counter-Strike Global Offensive, where unlike other Call of Duty games where you just hear a gunshot that's not suppressed, a red dot will appear on the map where it came from, I think more like Counter-Strike Global Offensive if your teammate is able to see someone who's firing, then you're able to see it on the mini-map because I guess the theory is in a real gunfight, your teammate's going to relay that information to you. And Call of Duty Black Ops 4 calls this the fog of war, where it, it isn't just, you know, uh, anything, any, any audible gunshots on the map from an opponent um, will appear. You actually have to have a teammate seeing it or, or somehow engaging with it. I'm, I'm not... 110% sure that's immediately but how it works, but I know there's something fundamentally different. And to me, I've always felt that was the most appropriate way to have sort of a tactical shooter or have that kind of competitive experience because there's plenty of times where I will hear a noise and I'm laying flat on my back and I can't tell if it's from the floor above me in a building or it's underneath me or it's to my left or to my right. And even if those of you guys who, who use, you know, Astro headsets or Turtle Beach headsets um, who, who often try to, you know, exploit hearing footsteps, still it's hard until the very last second to know sometimes where they're coming from unless you're, you're sitting in an area where the, where the, the doorway funnels them to you, you know, where there's only one way in and one way out. Um, so I really like the minimap. I think that's going to make things a little bit more tactical, a little bit harder to identify exactly where the opponents are coming from. And the biggest thing I also noticed was the longer time to kill and the smaller roster of team players. So it seems like it's a lot harder to eliminate a player. I've always felt like in Call of Duty, players are extremely squishy. Uh, if you're playing, you know, the original Modern Warfare 4 and you're using the M16 with, with stopping power, it's one hit from that burst and they're gone. Whereas during the Blackout beta, I was using the Barracuda, which is a burst rifle, and I had to hit players at least four times with it to knock them out. People are really beefy. I had a really hard time bringing down players and with the ability to either have a quick healing stim pack or body armor, which increases your base health from 150 to 200 or a motion sensor, it's really going to add a whole new dynamic to the game because you're not automatically healing anymore. And it's going to be like Counter-Strike where it, it, you're not going to get your health back at all. And at least in this game, you can still heal, but it's a bit slower. Um, and because it's not six on six, it's five on five. It's a lot more intimate. So if you immediately lose a player, uh, and it's a four on five. And because players are so beefy, that's going to make a real big difference. I've always felt like playing search and destroy when it's six on six, unless you're at the at absolute top tier of competition. I've never felt going into a game five on six with us being a team of five is too intimidating. But in a game where you have a lot of health and it's dense like Overwatch um, and you lose somebody, depending on the particular role they play, whether it's Overwatch, you know, if you're playing a character like Mercy or Genji, like it's they have an integral function on that team. Black Ops 4 is going to operate a little bit like that because the operators all have these very different uh, abilities that you can very clearly see, I think, if you participated in the beta, uh, are meant to, to all have their own unique team function. So if you lose your recon, whose vision pulse will show you where other players are on the map and he has the tracer dart, that's going to be a huge, huge liability. Or if you lose a player who drops you know, the razor wire or the, or the barricade for sort of an area of denial, uh, uh, advantage, that's gonna. That's also going to be a big hindrance too. So unlike a game of six on six in Call of Duty World War II where you're not a role player so much, even though the divisions have different advantages, um, I think it's going to be a lot more crucial if you lose you know, a player depending on the operator they've chosen. So it's really intimate, it's really team-based, and I think it's multidisciplinary uh, in the sense that it's not a matter of just losing a player, but what what operator they chose to play as, you know, so maybe some people might not feel so bad if they lose the Ruin, you know, the Ruin is, is the player that was a fan favorite in Black Ops 3 because of the gravity spikes and the grapple hook, uh, but I think that play style, according to the YouTube videos I've watched on it, favors players who are individual uh, playmakers and uh, like to rush, you know, so that might not be as uh, detrimental to your team on that round as losing, like I said, the recon, which I'm convinced is the single most important uh, player to the extent that I could barely select him 
uh, when I was playing in the beta because he was always taken. And that's another interesting thing. You're not going to be able to double up on operators as much anymore, I think, at the start of a round or a match. Um, much like Day of Defeat, where you couldn't remember Day of Defeat Source was that World War II shooter on Steam back in the day. Not everyone could select the snipers because their their damage was so high. Or not everyone could select the character that used the STG-44. It, it required you to sort of spread it out. So there's a little bit of Team Fortress, a little bit of Day of Defeat, a little bit of Overwatch. I like the inspiration Call of Duty Black Ops 4 has taken from a lot of these premier shooters that have become household names. So I'm super, super excited to see how that changes up uh, the competitive uh, landscape for this game. I had a really great time playing it. The recoil patterns are no longer random. They're like Counter-Strike Source where you have to learn a recoil pattern depending on the weapon, and that changes up everything as well. I found it was really, really hard to kill people in this game. I, I certainly struggled. I'm an SMG player. I like to rush, but I got to tell you, the weapon everyone was telling me that was so dominant, the MX-9, I thought that thing was great at getting hit markers but not kills. And I know I'm certainly in the minority uh, in, in that discussion, and I never use LMGs, but I got to tell you, the Titan, which was the only LMG available during the beta and the blackout, was my personal favorite weapon. Once you put uh, quick draw and the, and the stock on it, you're able to strafe and look down the sights like it's the scar in Modern Warfare 2. And it took out players in three hits, and that made me feel really comfortable right at home. And if you get a chance to look at all three of my blackout duo wins, I ended each one of them by using the Titan. I, I thought that was the best kept secret of the beta, and I felt really relieved when I saw some a particular YouTuber with a lot more of a platform than I do uh, rank that as the number one gun of the beta as well because I thought I was crazy thinking an LMG was that good but it just has great stopping power and the recoil pattern was easy to control too so I had a really 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 great time playing the beta and I am just absolutely running out of things to do before the game comes out on October 12th I honestly don't think playing Black Ops 3 or World War 2 gives you much preparation for it just because of all the things I mentioned with the increased health uh, and the map differences uh, and the recoil patterns of the weapons. So I don't even feel like I should just be playing World War II all day, every day, because I don't think that much of it will trans translate over. But um, anyway, yeah, Black Ops 4, super excited for that, and I can't wait. So yeah, you can obviously tell I'm very, very, very excited for Black Ops 4. I really do think it's going to be a great, intimate team experience, and I am so excited to try and make a team myself participate in the MLG game battles and some of the LAN or online events that are characterized under the Path to Pro um, system and see if we can play against some of the top players in the world. Because esports, when I was a kid, esports was in its infancy. There was one player, he played Quake 3 professionally. His name was Jonathan Wendell Holmes. I think he's Give it, been given or is getting a Lifetime Achievement Award uh, for what he's done in esports. He had his own brand of computer mice where you could push down on the center of it and take out you know, different weights and change the DPI on the fly. And it even had three clicky buttons on the top, which was kind of hard to, to grip at the time unless you used what players called the claw grip. But anyway, the point was Counter-Strike Source really shook up the world when Half-Life 2 won Game of the Year. And this was around 2004. I was probably in the seventh grade. And uh, yeah, I never thought esports would take off, but once I started seeing commercials for Counter-Strike tournaments in the Barclays Center, which is where the Brooklyn Nets play, and I talked about this a little bit you know, on the podcast I did, user-friendly, the podcast that Deloitte & Touche has for their media and entertainment trends, uh, I, whether I had liked it or not, esports had certainly turned the corner in it, and I know I'm 25 and haven't really participated in any of that since doing Counter-Strike source scrimmages, you know where you had to download MIRC and find a team to scrimmage against, and then you copied and pasted the IP address into the console to find the servers that weren't publicly you know, de uh, displayed. It was just a lot harder to get, back, to get into back then, and I was a lot younger. So now that this stuff has become so mainstream, I'm really interested to see if I can find a team of guys to play uh, Call of Duty Black Ops 4 competitively with. It's crazy. It's moving so fast. The game's coming out October 12th, and the first LAN event's going to be, I think, December 15th in Las Vegas. And... Uh, MLG did have a 40-minute press conference or a presentation. I got a chance to watch about half of it. I do need to, to dig deeper into the, what the details are for people who are interested in getting into that because I think, you know, uh, it, it's different if you're already established pro versus someone trying to achieve pro points. But we got some other stuff to talk about. I don't want to spend too much time talking about Black Ops 4. I, not, I know not everybody's as excited about that game as I am, but uh, it, it's relevant, and I wanted to kind of just talk about it a little bit because I think Treyarch – when they announced the game, they said they were going to try to make sort of the most lofty, in-depth, and Call of Duty game with the most replayability. And I think so far it's uh, it's shaping up to look like that. But um, if we backtrack a little bit and talk about gaming and music, since I'm trying to sort of build a, a nice body of uh, uh, credits with writing articles, articles about games, doing podcasts and interviews... Um, 
I reached out to Grant Kirkhope, who actually did the soundtrack for Perfect Dark, GoldenEye, Donkey Kong 64, Donkey Kong Land 2 on the original Game Boy, and Ubisoft and Nintendo's crossover with Mario and the Rabbids. And he was kind enough to agree to do an interview with me this Tuesday. So I'm really looking forward to talking to him. He's done a lot of interviews. Um, he's a great, great, great guy and a big name in the gaming industry. So I don't want to have that same general long form interview. I, I know he's been on Game Grumps and in preparation for my conversation with him, I've watched a couple of interviews he's done. And I got to admit, a lot of the questions I want to ask, he's already been asked. But I want to spend most of the time talking about, since I think the game is going through uh, you know, a 20th anniversary, um, I wanted to spend some time asking him about how he conceptualized the music for GoldenEye. And what I mean by that is GoldenEye, every level is dramatically different. The cradle is different than the bunker, which is different than the facility, which is different than the archives. And every song, I think, matches it perfectly well, but the songs are also dramatically different. So whether it's, you know, uh, Vivaldi's The Seasons or Gustav Holst's The Planets, you know, uh, these are all classical music pieces, you know, about winter, summer, spring, and, you know, Mars, Jupiter, and Pluto and stuff like that. I feel like the songs match the qualities of, of the of the source material, if you will, so, so well. You know, Mars is the god of war, and the song Mars, uh, Holst's, Gustav Holst's classical song, Mars, has this big, you know, really aggressive march, and, and it sounds like it fits that appropriately. So if we're going back to Goldeneye, and we're talking about, you know, the statue, which is the part in the movie where James Bond learns that 006 is really the antagonist known as Yanis, who's two-faced and duplicitous and the story basically goes that you know his his contemporary at mi6 his parents were uh, uh given up by the brits during world war ii to stalin and stalin had them promptly executed anyway that that scene takes place in a in a i think it's a graveyard or it's just a place where a bunch of former soviet statues were were left but it has the hammer and sickle it has lenin and it's a repository of all the soviet era stuff and the music for that particular level has a lot of brass it sounds like a big band it sounds like a big military sort of soviet band so it fits appropriately so well um and the music for the cradle which is the final level of the game i think is is just action-packed and the quintessential way to end a level and i don't want to spoil this but i'm gonna have to spoil it you know i want to just ask questions like what what made you think to make the song on Cradle go immediately into double time. And those of you who've played Golden, I know exactly what I'm talking about. The song starts playing while the cutscene for the level is still going, and you can see Trevelyan running across the bridge. And the entire level is basically a shootout between you and Trevelyan. And once you, you know, you guys shoot at each other a little bit, and if you make contact with him, there's a line of dialogue that he'll feed you from the film. But then eventually, when you hit him enough times, he breaks out and does a crazy fast sprint to to the bottom of this antenna, which is suspended up in the sky. So the cradle is is the map is actually suspended in the sky. And the last fight you're going to have with him is at the very bottom of an ele at the very bottom of a ladder shaft on a platform that only two of you could really fit on. But once you trigger the sort of final form of him, the song just goes like did it 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 it goes way faster and you hear the drums going and the cymbals and it, it fits so well. So I'm really excited to kind of sit down and talk to him about what it was like to kind of conceptualize the music for Goldeneye. And uh, I'm hoping to get into a conversation about what it was like to do it for Perfect Dark as well, because that game is so far in the future. It's like Blade Runner. And I kind of want to know, uh, does that musically give you a lot of options to do completely different stuff? Um, you know, because like I said, in Goldeneye, the jungle map, the music sounds like it's jungle inspired, but I don't know if there are as many rules when you're doing something sort of intergalactic themed and very differently from Goldeneye, with the exception of Cradle, the music in Perfect Dark goes from completely just, uh, I don't know how to explain it, just neutral. And then it will just like pick up like crazy. The minute you turn a corner and see a bunch of guards, it'll just bust out and be hyper aggressive really fast. And it, the only way I can explain it is like if, if someone with a chainsaw is chasing you and you're running for your life and there's a door in front of you and you have a whole key ring of keys and you're trying to find the right key to open that door as he's getting closer, the music is so aggressive and fast, it's hard to, to fight off the opponent, stick to the mission objectives um, when that music is playing so aggressively. In Perfect Dark, the soundtrack does a really, really good job of giving you that ominous sense of urgency. Uh, that the game captivates so well. So anyway, stay tuned for my conversation with Grant Kirkhope. I'm looking forward to doing it. I'm extremely nervous. This is the first time I've ever interviewed anybody. So it's kind of a big name to score for your first interview, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to make a lasting impression with these kind of creative outlets here. So I figured let's just dive into it headfirst and see what we do. I'm not sure if I'll record the whole conversation in its entirety, or I'll try to transcribe the conversation into something that can be read. 
I'm not sure yet, but I'm really looking forward to my conversation with him. Gaming soundtracks have always been something I've been fascinated with uh, ever since I heard Dancing Mad from Final Fantasy VI or Birth of a God from Final Fantasy VII. Sometimes I think the music really makes the game, and I just had such a memorable experience, both with the soundtrack of Perfect Dark and GoldenEye, and I'm really excited to sit down and talk to him about it. Couple other things I want to talk about before we wrap up here with our first episode. Um, I'm excited. I'm also excited for Mega Man 11. You know, those of you who who are watching me because you remember me from Twitch know that we played the hardest games of all time, or games on their hardest difficulty, sight unseen. And the overwhelming majority of those games were were platformers. They were games like Ninja Gaiden, Ghost and Goblins, Mario Brothers 2: The Lost Levels, Battletoads. Um, they were all side-scrolling platformers. All the Contras. And I think platformers have become my favorite genre of non-multiplayer shooters, hands down. For some strange reason, as a kid, when I had the original Sony PlayStation and even the Super Nintendo, I wasn't crazy about Mega Man X. I know that's sacrilegious to say, or not Mega Man X, just the, the series as a whole. I didn't really like Zero. I didn't really like Mega Man with this giant red gem stuck in the middle of his head. I, I you know, I like the original, the Blue Bomber. So... A couple years ago, we did something called the Mega Man Marathon of May, where we played the original six Mega Man games on the Famicom, uh, which was super cool because those cartridges, they look like soap bars, and they're color-coded, and they'll hold all six in your hand. looks pretty neat. It's like having all the Pokemon games on the Game Boy Color. They all got their own uh, uh, color scheme and, and art style on the sticker. It was pretty neat. Those of you who know the American depiction of Mega Man, where it's kind of a guy with an actual gun, I mean, the two couldn't be further apart. But anyway, they're also... A lot easier to get your hands on in terms of the price, uh, particularly uh, Mega Man. Uh, uh, I can't remember which one it was. Oh, I'm sorry, Mega Man 7 for the Super Famicom. But now there's the Mega Man Legacy Collection Part 1 and 2 that you're able to obtain from Steam or on any of the three major platforms as well. So I highly encourage you to get out there and play the original Mega Man games. You won't regret it. They're a ton of fun. The soundtrack's incredible. And uh, they're really memorable games. They're, Mega Man, you know, it's funny. Growing up, Capcom was my favorite company for video games. I loved the Marvel vs. Capcom franchise. I loved Street Fighter. And I loved Resident Evil. I didn't like Mega Man. Uh, and the first time I ever really engaged with Mega Man was a, as a playable character in the Marvel vs. Capcom arcade cabinet. But when we did that marathon last May, I just fell in love with it as a platforming thing. I thought it blew Mario out of the water. I thought it blew Ghosts and Goblins out of the water. I thought it blew Contra out of the water. I really liked the Robot Masters and, and picking up the right weapons and fighting the dragon in Mega Man 2. And I thought Mega Man 3 is a bona fide masterpiece of a game because it has all the Robot Masters from the second. And it kind of, it's like Ghosts and Goblins. When you think you're done with it, there's a whole other part of the game left. It's a, it's a full-on masterpiece. I don't know how it's even a debate between two and three. Three rocks the house, and it's incredibly hard, which for me, a game has got to be challenging for it to really make a lasting impression. Mega Man 3, if you don't play any of those six games, I, I recommend you play Mega Man 3. But anyway, wow, talk about a long-winded introduction. Mega Man 11. Uh, I had the privilege to check out the trailer and watch somebody play the demo for GamingNexus.com, and I'm excited. Uh, I'm excited because it's it's a new installation in the original franchise of it. I know that they've been working on other Mega Man X stuff. The Mega Man Zero franchise and the Game Boy Advance is really liked. And um, it's nice to see the original Bomber get a new installation in the franchise. I was super, super happy to see Mega Man be a, a secret character in the previous Smash Brothers and to know that he's making a return in the newest Smash Brothers. If we can take a quick little detour, the newest Smash Brothers game is going to be so exciting because it has every single character that's ever made an appearance in Smash Brothers. So I think it's going to be really epic. And uh, I was excited to see that Richter and Simon Belmont from the Castlevania franchise are going to make an appearance as playable characters, as well as Alucard as an assist trophy. Um, I, I wish I could find the Twitch stream where I was saying this years ago, but I always said because of his, his weapons and utility that the Belmont character from Castlevania would, would be a perfect fit. And I don't know why they didn't add him when they added the dog and uh, the duck from Duck Hunt or Little Mac or Game & Watch from Melee. Like they, they clearly have paid homage to some of the throwback stuff. I was shocked it took as long as it did, but better late than never, right? So I'm super, super excited for the new Smash Bros. It might be the thing that gets me to run out and get a Switch. Um, my next prediction for the new character, I think they should add, uh, and I think they can do it because they added someone like Cloud. They added someone like Ryu. I read an article about this, about how their introduction of characters from, from different platforms and storylines, and in the case of Ness, which was the purpose of the article, a character from a game that was Japanese exclusive. It just opened so many doors for me as, as far as a gamer is concerned. Smash Brothers has been 
a great ambassador for introducing people to new games and franchises. So once they added Sonic the Hedgehog and Brawl, uh, I got thinking that they need to add Earthworm Jim. I thought Earthworm Jim was another amazing platformer that we played. Uh, your character has a gun like Mega Man. He's got a lot of utility and uh, just a, a fantastic game, uh, a fantastic, I was going to say trilogy. I, I forgot Rockstar made Earthworm Jim on the N64. The first two games were real blockbusters, and they, they, there was even an animated show where the voice of Earthworm Jim was the voice of Homer Simpson. The humor of the game and, and sort of the irreverence it has, I think, captivates a lot of the animation of the 1990s, and Earthworm Jim would just be great. I don't know if a lot of the, the, the target demographic of Smash Brothers would you know, be, a, and be in favor of that. That's kind of a 90s kid thing, but I think Earthworm Jim should certainly make an appearance in the next Smash Brothers, if not this one. But uh, I am super psyched for Smash Brothers Ultimate. I think it's already available for pre-order, but it's coming out in early December. And I got to say, it's going to be so hard, guys. It's going to be so hard to pick a game to play full time and try to play it competitively. I, I spent some time learning how to wave dash so I could try to get into the melee scene because, I, you know, it was just like what I said about esports earlier. I had no idea that would be the game that took off. I mean, I still think the original Smash Brothers and the original Mario Kart have the most replayability to me out of any game that's ever been been made but unfortunately the n64 smash bros i don't think there's much of a scene for that and i play that you know at, at land parties and, and against several several people so i always felt so left out that melee is the one that took off so i spent some time trying to learn the exploits and the wave dashing and it's not easy but my point was uh, until black ops 4 comes out i've like had all this time on my hands as a gamer to decide what what game we should spend our time with but that month is going to go by fast but my point is i'm going to i'm going to be kind of bummed spending so much time on black ops 4 missing out on smash brothers and missing out on the new world of warcraft expansion pack you can say what you want about wow but when it came out in 2004 it was just groundbreaking because it was a bunch of online people in one spot and games like oblivion that had come out on the xbox 360 and fable on the xbox were so critically acclaimed but you're the only player in that world i think it was all npcs so the fact that world of warcraft was like that but with real players it blew my mind and i still have a lot of reverence and awe for the franchise didn't obviously end up renewing my subscription to get into that because it's just as much of a commitment as getting good at smash brothers or getting good at black ops you know trying to join a guild do pvp do raids it's going to be a full-time uh, uh, commitment and I, I just can't do that you can only you, I, I think you can only really be amazing at one thing I'm sure a lot of gamers would disagree but anyway uh, Mega Man 11 is going to be a great game and it's going to come out on all of the three major platforms so I highly encourage you to get out there and give it a shot and uh, at the very least check out Mega Man 3 it's it's one of the best platformers that that has ever been invented um, yeah so Mega Man 11 I'm looking forward to that and the last thing I want to wrap up with here is going to be uh, the announcement of the PlayStation Classic I I don't know how these things work. Um, I've, I've heard people talk, you know, what I'm trying to say is I've heard people talk about the N64 Classic, and a lot of the games that were so popular on the N64 are, are made by Rare, which is owned by Microsoft, right? So you're going to make the N64 Classic, and you're not going to have games like Banjo-Kazooie, Banjo-Tooie, Perfect Dark, GoldenEye, um, um, Jet Force Gemini, right? You're going to have all the first-party in-house stuff, which is still amazing because you'll have Mario 64, Mario Kart, Mario Party, Mario Tennis, Mario Golf. <laughs> you see where I'm going with this. Smash Brothers. Um, I don't know if it works that way, but my, my concern with the PlayStation was um, what games are they going to put on it? I think I saw, I wish I could give the guy credit. Someone on Twitter posted a list of what they wanted to see, and I didn't bother posting my own because it was it, it took the words right out of my mouth. It had everything from the Crash Bandicoot trilogies to Twisted Metal 2 to Metal Gear Solid to Chrono Cross, Final Fantasy 6 VI and 7. So I'm excited for that. I'm really interested to see what games they end up putting on it because I know they only announced five. I got a lot of fond memories with the PlayStation. Um, the N64 was just, I don't know, a multiplayer's paradise. The only game I can remember playing with four people on the original Sony PlayStation was Crash Bash, which was kind of like Crash Bandicoot's version of Mario Party with the minigames. But I'm excited to see what they end up doing with the PlayStation. I, I've said this a lot. Any of these throwback consoles that use HDMI make life so easy for you because we played so many excruciatingly hard games unbeknownst to me with a large input delay and i thought well if you push the a button and it takes a whole second and then the character jumps that's an input delay but that's not what an input delay is necessarily it can be much less than that it's measured in milliseconds so i thought because it wasn't so blatantly obvious you know our composite to hdmi upscaler wasn't causing any problems so that's why I think the Retron 5 is an incredible device because it allows you to play Famicom, NES, Sega Genesis, Master System, Super Nintendo games, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance games. Runs it through HDMI. You can hook it up to an Elgato capture card so you could stream it and record it without any issues. 
So while I tend to still play all my games on the original Sony PlayStation using composite cables, I think what would I have to do? I'd have to get an older Elgato capture card that has the conversion cables and record it just from the composite. So the Sony PlayStation Mini might be great if we wanted to stream Final Fantasy VII or something like that, although people would say, well, you could just get it on Steam. So uh, I, I really appreciate how much easier these new mini consoles have made life or just the backwards compatibility in general. Uh, I, I'm convinced I'm the only person on the planet who bought an Xbox One X at release for 500 bucks so that they could play Perfect Dark without the draw distance problems and the frame rate slowdown. I really wanted to play the game the way I'm convinced the game was made to be played because people always say it's better than GoldenEye in every single way, but I think just because it was lofty and, and tried to be more innovative but didn't work, I don't mean like th their creativity and attempts fell short. I'm just saying the hardware of the N64 has pushed too much to its limits. I don't know if that makes it a better game by default. So when you play it on the 360 or you play a great game like Treasure's Radiant Silver Gun, which is an obscenely expensive game to try to get your hands on for the sake of Saturn, the fact that those are five or six bucks a pop on the Xbox Live store and you're playing it on the Xbox One X so you can stream it and record it with ease, to me, that was worth the price of picking up the Xbox One. There wasn't really, you know, at the time I bought the console, Halo had already been, you know, three years old, Halo 5 Guardians. And uh, unbeknownst to me, Call of Duty had an exclusive deal with the PlayStation 4, which is what introduced me to, to playing PlayStation 4. I, Xbox was always synonymous to me as the multiplayer console because, you know, Halo 2 helped sell Xbox Live. And I don't think PlayStation 3 even had a party chat system. So it's amazing to see how, uh, you know, the, the shoe's on the other foot and, and there's been a changing of the guard. But... Um, Anyway, I'm excited to see what games they end up putting on the PlayStation 1 Classic. Do you guys have any particular uh, memorable PlayStation 1 titles that you'd like to see on there? I, I know there's going to be a lot of votes for Final Fantasy VII, Metal Gear Solid, a lot of those epic single-player storyline games. Um, but anyway, yeah, that that's going to wrap up the first episode. I, I had a really good time doing this. I'm looking forward to posting another one next week. Let me know what you guys think on the comment section down below. I'm going to try to post this on YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch. But I had a fun time. And uh, yeah, I'll catch up with you guys next week. Thanks a lot for listening in.